Today on the show, all the spiced coffee is uh, is hitting different, and got voices from our other memory keep asking us Dune lore questions. Is it suspicious if we keep claiming we're not abomination? <laughs> like explicitly, <laughs> we're not. I mean, I'm almost convinced the voices in our head are perhaps real people who listen to us. What? Oh no, <laughs> it's even worse, right? <laughs> Is it not weird that our ancestors would be asking like very relevant (laughs) questions to a podcast we're doing now? I mean, aren't they're riding? They're along for the ride. (laughs) (laughs) They've got that built-in patron subscription, (laughs) right? Welcome to Gam Jabbar, your guide to the iconic world of Dune. We'll be exploring the themes, philosophies, and characters found in the sandy depths of this vast universe, from Frank Herbert's groundbreaking novels to the adaptations on film and TV. My name's Abu. My name is Leo. And Leo, we got some questions today. Yeah, we did. We asked, you delivered. Yes, what a fun set of questions today. I can't wait to get into it, but... We should take care of some housekeeping first. Indeed. Spoiler warning for today. Spoiler free. Up to the pages we've covered so far in the Children of Dune book club, we're not going to talk about anything beyond that. So if you're up to date with our book club, you are good to go. That's right. And of course, the best way to support the show is to become a patron at patreon.com slash gomjabar. Yep. You get cool benefits like completely ad free episodes and early access to these book club episodes. You hear them months before the rest of the world does. It's true. Of course, we also want to give a huge shout out to our Quizats Hatterack level patron, Case Aiken. Case, if your voice simmered up from the other voices, immediate abomination. I'd hand over the reins, I'd give you my Honda Civic 100%. Yeah, buddy. Possess me all you want. <laughs> <laughs> Consider checking out our merchandise at gomjabarshop.com. It is all Dune themed and features original designs, artwork, and deep cut references that pretty much only you and other Gomjabar listeners will understand. The best kind of merch. The best. I like it. Yeah. And a reminder that you should be emailing us. If you missed your chance to get your questions submitted for today's mailbag, not to worry, because we are planning on one more mailbag over the course of this Children of Dune book club series, so you still have time to email us at gomjabarpodcast at gmail.com. Check the schedule in the show notes to make sure you send that email before that next mailbag episode. Indeed. Of course, if you're hearing this on the public feed, just be aware that... These book club episodes and these mailbag episodes were recorded months in advance for our patron members. So your question may not be included in that upcoming mailbag episode, but you should still send it because we still do regular old mailbag episodes on the public feed for all of our listeners as well. So send that email anyway, and we may address it in a future episode. Yeah. Well, with housekeeping out of the way, Let's take a quick break, and when we're back, we'll get into your messages and our responses. Stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back, folks. Let's crack open these D-strands and respond to your emails. (laughs) Let's open these bats. (laughs) (laughs) First up, we have an email from Paul. Yo! Not, not, no, 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 not that Paul. Oh, (laughs) Regular non-Messiah Paul. Well, TBD, I mean. (laughs) Well, yeah, true. He's got time. He's got time to Messiah it up. (laughs) Paul wrote to us and said, Have you guys considered doing a deep dive episode into Alia Atreides? She's one of my favorite characters, and I would love to learn more about her. Another question that I have is the matter of being pre-born. You guys said that Alia is like a Kwisatz Haderach. She has the memories of her male line, but so do Leto and Ganema. 
Do all preborn children have memories of both male and female lines, or is it a product of the Kwisatz Haderach genes? What a good question. Yeah. And an episode on Alia is a great idea. Some of our favorite episodes that we've done are the kind of character deep dives because they bring so much to familiar pages. Like we have the Lady Jessica, Peter DeVry University, Gurney definitely fucks Halleck. <laughs> 100%. We will do an episode on Alia. Yes, we'll definitely be revisiting Alia in a future episode. To answer Paul's question about being preborn, though, in short, yeah, it's because Alia and Leto II and Ganema all share Paul's Kwisatz Haderach genetics, basically. That is what allows them to access both their male and female genetic memories. And of course, in addition to that, those genes also make them super, super sensitive to prescience. Right. But, you know, there are a few requirements. You don't just get to have these powers if you have the right genes. <laughs> right. You have to also have the right combination of spice exposure, which, of course, all of these characters have, considering they live on Arrakis and all they do is consume spice day in and day out. Right. And you also have to undergo some sort of spice agony. For Alia, it was being pre-born when her mother went through the ritual in Siege to Burr. And for Paul, it was when he drank the water of life and went into his weeks-long goma. <laughs> right, right. So Paul and Alia have actually undergone a type of spice agony and unlocked that full genetic memory and are sensitive to prescience. Paul, more than Alia, of course, as we've discussed. Lazo and Ganema do you have access to their other memories, but they haven't gone through a type of spice agony to fully unlock their prescience. Right. They are pre-born because Chani was eating so much spice at the end of her life, so they had a tremendous amount of spice saturation. Uh, yeah. But you're right. Like, they, in their, uh, like, born lives have not yet gone through that catalyzing effect. I'll also answer this question in a slightly different angle because I realize there's another reading of it. We don't meet other preborn children who are not Atreides, so the amount of information that we have about them is <laughs> pretty limited. I also get the impression that the Bene Gesserit pretty offhandedly murdered anybody who was remotely possibly abomination. Yes. So, yes. We don't know a lot about other preborn children, but it seems like it is the genetics that really plays an important part in all of this. For sure. That's a great point. We only interact with and spend a lot of time with some very, very special preborn children. So it's hard to make blanket statements about the nature of being preborn. Right. Because they're already so special because of their genetics. I also wanted to quickly mention that we also shouldn't paint with too broad a brush, even when it does come to these main characters. Because even within Paul, Alia, Leto, Ganema, there are varying levels of these powers. Paul, of course, had like Super Saiyan prescience. Whereas Alia struggles to even get solid glimpses of a future that makes sense, right? right? No matter how much spice she intakes. So training also plays a factor. You can have the right genes. You can have the right dose of spice. You can undergo the spice agony, but you also need the sort of physical and mental training to utilize those skills. And that leads to different levels of expertise, like Paul, for example, he's got all the training, right? Yeah. He's got the Benny Gesserit arts through his mom's trainings. He was being raised to be a mentat. He is obviously proficient in combat strategy, military strategy, politics. Like he was being raised to be the next head of House Atreides. So he had all of this training in the first 14, 15 years of his life before his powers kicked into high gear. That helped him manage those powers better than someone like Alia, who just kind of was born with them. Right. And kind of tossed into the deep end from even before she was born. Yes, she may have inherited some of those powers because of her other memory, but as we've established actually over the course of this book, just having the other memory and being skilled at a thing are two very different things. Right. A couple episodes ago, you gave this great example of how Leto II may know how to play a Balaset because someone in his other memory knows how to play a Balaset super well. 
but that doesn't mean his small nine-year-old fingers will be effective at it, right? Right. Like he still needs to build the muscle memory, even though he had intellectually knows it because of his other memory. Yeah. And we see that. Like literally we see him struggling to play Balasset. And to your point, I think there's a lot of X factors here. Like I just can't get over that possibility that the reason Paul was so prescient is because of the Mentat training. You know, like yeah. legitimately the 15 years of being like having your brain's neural pathways conditioned to sort data in a certain way may give you like random visions of the future interlocking as solid prescience. Yep. Compared to someone who doesn't. That's speculation, but that's what we're left with at the end of the day. Because a lot of these mechanisms uh, were not set in stone as like cut and dry algebraic rules. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you for the great question, Paul. And I hope that was more of an answer than you expected, <laughs> which is the Gam Jabbar guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> also, if you have like a bunch of followers, just chill it on the like planet sterilization. All right, Paul. <laughs> Thanks, bud. Appreciate it. <laughs> now, our next question comes from Nick. Hey, guys, I have a quick question, which I would welcome your thoughts on. I have noticed that both the terms universe and galaxy are used in various sources when discussing Dune. You guys also use both terms. Do you know if the events of Dune are confined to the single galaxy or if the guild achieved intergalactic travel? I don't have the Dune encyclopedia. Maybe it's mentioned in there? If not, I would value your opinions. Wow. I love it. What a great question, Nick. Yeah. Yeah. I never thought of that. <laughs> I was yeah, like, honestly, in all this yeah, time. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So to answer your question, Nick, we got Neil deGrasse Tyson on the line. <laughs> um, he's going to explain. <laughs> Neil, you there? Hey, Neil. Neil? Did he, did he hang up? No. I mean, he's in the call. He's just muted. N Neil? Oh. Okay. Oh. We'll get him. We'll get him yeah, fixed well, ne for uh, next, uh, next yeah, episode. Ne next time. Next time. Let's edit this part out. <laughs> So we'll leave that mystery hanging whether or not we actually have him on the line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in short, to try and answer Nick's question here, in short, so far in the story, through the books and pages we've covered up through Children of Dune, we have no reason to believe that any of the story takes place outside of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. The Imperium, of course, is a galactic empire, but it seems to be just that galactic and not universal there is no hints in the story or in, even in the expanded lore thus far that anything in the dune universe takes place in a different galaxy it's important to remember that the reach of humanity is limited by the technology and the ambitions of the spacing guild right they they have a monopoly on all travel basically so yeah. you yeah. can only go as far as they will take you basically right and, you know, faster than light travel exists, but instantaneous interstellar travel does not exist according to Dune's prime canon. But I also found myself questioning the scope and scale of what we're talking about in a way that just, it doesn't make sense to me how big a galaxy is. So I did some digging, and while this isn't exactly canon, which is to say it's not canon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this may give a better understanding of the scale of your question, Nick, but I think for, every, for all of us, I think this is helpful. And it includes a little shout out to an author, Joseph Daniels, who mm -hmm. put together just a fucking amazing thing, which is The Stars and Planets of Frank Herbert's Dune, A Gazetteer, which was in 1999. And it is staggering how much work Joseph put into this article, this like yeah, thing. Truly. Basically, he cross referenced Dune's planets with the planets and stars that Frank used in his research. And it's cool. It'll be like Caladan. And then it gives you a breakdown of that planet's qualities in a way that are pulled from Dune, but also pulled from astrological information. Really neat. Yeah. And I want to give some numbers that Joseph 
speculates regarding what he thinks are most likely the distances to these places that Frank wrote about. But for reference, the nearest galaxy to ours, they are 75,000 light years from Earth. But here are some examples of distances. Caledon, home world of Paul Atreides, 19.9 light years from Earth. Wow, a hop and a skip? A hop and or a skip. Quick, easy. <laughs> Arrakis, 312.7 light years <laughs> from us. And the furthest I could find, the highest number Joseph referenced, is Bella Tegus, which was 1,284 light years. Yeah. And so uh, obviously none of those are even close to 75,000 light years away. Right. Now, none of this would matter if faster than light travel were instantaneous. But one of the other things that I came upon is verification of the fact that with Holtzman engines, at this point in Children of Dune, humanity is capable of faster than light travel, but it's not instantaneous. It takes time. You know, the first publication of Dune in Analog Magazine, someone on Team Harkonnen was saying about House Atreides moving to Arrakis, quote, the entire household of the Duke Leto will embark on a spacing guild liner for Arrakis. The guild will deposit them on Arrakis within a standard month, end quote. There you go. Travel times. And the point here is that this implies there is a limit, right, to how far humanity can go. Right. You can presumably travel 1,200 light years to get to Bella Tagus, and the guild's technology will support that and get you there. Maybe it won't take you 10 years. It'll take you two weeks. Right. But getting somewhere that's 75,000 light years away in a different galaxy, that still seemingly has a cap on it. You know, like the technology itself implies that there's a cap to how many light years away the Spacing Guild can reasonably take you. Right. Really, what could have been a three word answer ended up referencing like three or four levels of canonicity. <laughs> it involved a half hour uh, digging of, of galactic distances and all sorts of things. Oops. <laughs> The Gam Jabbar promise, we took too long on a relatively <laughs> quick question, uh, but thank you so much, Nick. What a good question. Fun yeah. thing to explore, thing to talk about. Definitely. It's always fun getting into these more obscure theories. All right. Next up, we have a question from Simoko, who said in the email that folks sometimes call them James. This is what they wrote. I've been trying to figure out exactly why the Quisarate were part of the conspiracy against Paul and how exactly their actions in Messiah fit into the bigger picture of the conspiracy. What were the Quisarate conspirators hoping to accomplish by almost nuking the freaking planet with that stone burner? <laughs> Frank, of course, did a very good job of fleshing out that snake Cobra, uh, I mean Corba, as someone who was clearly envious of the position Paul occupied at the head of of the Muad'Dib cult. But I feel like it would have been good if we had gotten a bit more of a look into the Quisarate and why they chose to link up with Sightail and that ragtag band of out of their death mischiefs who were trying to kill Space Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be clear here. The Cobra Corba joke was something Samoka wrote. And so funny. The whole email's incredible. Like yeah. Gom Jabarian in length. Very long. <laughs> Truly. And glorious. <laughs> and even in the first three paragraphs, there were 10 deep cut Gamjabar jokes and references. Amazing. Absurd and delightful. He also included his pitch for an absolutely incredible HBO series, which would be, quote, be rated R for weirdness. I'm thinking Lovecraft Country meets Twilight Zone meets Westworld meets Black Mirror with a heavy dose of spice and that precious oregano. <laughs> oh <laughs> my <quote>. God. <laughs> James Sumoko, top marks, my friend. Amazing. Absolutely incredible email. Thank you. Yeah, truly. Okay, so let's try to tackle Sumoko's question and talk about the Quisarate because they're right that we don't have a ton of insight 
into this group and their motivations. So to start off, I wanted to make a slight correction to Samoko's question because Dune Messiah is incredibly confusing. There are plots yep. within plots within <laughs> plots. Yeah. This is a very easy detail to miss, but the Kisarate never actually teamed up with the Tleilaxu. And in fact, the fucking stone burner threw a giant nuclear sized wrench into Sidetail's plans <laughs> <laughs> that he had to like pivot and work around. Uh, J waves. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. This is what the Dune Encyclopedia tells us. Quote, the source and purpose of the stone burner has been the subject of endless historical arguments. Using the device served to the ends of neither the Bene Gesserit, who needed to preserve the Atreides genes for their breeding program, nor the Tleilaxu, who could not regenerate Chani from radioactive ash. <laughs> the favorite school of thought is that the bomb was emplaced by agents of the Spacing Guild, who were betraying their partners, especially Sidetail, who would have been caught in the blast to achieve the death of the Emperor and the advancement of still another force in the drama, the Kisarate. End quote. Right. So, in short, what that's telling us is that Operation Nuke Jesus <laughs> seems to be a plan that was cooked up between the Spacing Guild and the Kizarate, and it was something that was completely unknown to the Tleilaxu, something that caught Sightail off guard and very nearly would have killed him, too. <laughs> right. Dune Messiah is incredibly confusing and has plans within plans within plans running in parallel to one another. Very confusing and easy to get mixed up. But to James's question, to Simoko's question, it's important to note the Kizarate can't necessarily be painted with too broad a brush because while they are a body of power and controlled by a select few who are corrupt and are doing shit, most members of the Kizarate were just missionaries of Muad'Dib. Right. The corrupt actions of the Kizarate attempting to kill Paul isn't even necessarily something everyone was on board with. And we actually get this little quote, in the wake of Paul leaving the world behind, we get this little excerpt about Korba's treason. Quote, The Kizarate was shaken by the treason of Korba and others high within it. End quote. Yeah. And it's easy to miss, I think, because for most of the book, Kizarate and Korba are basically synonymous. <laughs> like, he is the embodiment of what the Kizarate is up to. Right. But Korba and the, uh, and the higher-ups, the kind of like select few in power, are the ones with the corrupt aspirations. They're the ones trying to kill Paul, not every member of the organization under some unified belief that their god should be dead or something like that, you know? Yeah, definitely. And look, we can try and make some assumptions about the leadership as well. Right. We don't want to paint too broad a brush and say the entire Kizarate was like this, but why were the leadership looking to kill Paul? That's still worth exploring. Right. The assumption we can make is that Korba and this corrupt group of leadership realized basically the same thing that Paul realized himself about his faith, his godhood, and his place in this society and in this government. Right. If Paul were to die, he'd be martyred, right? He is now so holy that his every act is an act of holiness, is recorded down in history. And him dying means that he would live on forever. His name would live on forever and people would continue to worship him. That's sort of the level of God that he's achieved. And the Kizarate know this. Right. So getting rid of Paul would kind of give Korba and the Kizarate leadership this perfect chance to use the image of Muad'Dib, right? They are his priests, selected by him, presumably. And so if he's not around anymore, they can still continue to operate and continue to hold that status and power in his name without any fear of the actual messiah calling them out for something he doesn't like because we know the kizarate are, are up to shit that paul doesn't know about right shout store boy bronzo right like <laughs> there are dungeons where people are being tortured that paul doesn't know about 
Right. So getting rid of Paul is a way to sort of continue doing that and to maintain and even gain power because now the Messiah can't question your actions, but you can do whatever you want in the Messiah's name. Because it's much easier to put words in a dead Messiah's mouth than to try and manage one who's alive and quite volatile, you know? One who's like feeling guilty about killing 61 billion people. Yeah. Great point. Well, Samoka, that was a really fun question and a fun rabbit hole to go down. Thank you so much for sending your incredible email in and for submitting your pitch to HBO. We will try to forward that to HBO once we get them on the line, once they reply to our hundreds of emails. Indeed. With that, let's actually take a bit of a breather. This has been some heavy theory crafting and some deep cut lore stuff. Let's take a breather. But after the short break, we're going to dive into some more lighthearted and even some off-topic questions. These will be fun. We'll see you in a minute. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, Neil is still here. I was just waiting to hear from him. Uh, still having tech <laughs> problems, but glad you're back. Let's get into our second half. Let's talk about these other listener messages. First up, we've got a question about Fremen eyewear from Lucas from Austria. Lucas says, I went for a walk the other day in blazing sunlight and had to stop to get my sunglasses out of my backpack because the sun was so bright. Then I wondered how it came that the Fremen aren't using some type of glasses or goggles. I know, they mostly sleep or rest during the day, at least they did before Muad'Dib, but still, one thought that came to my mind was that maybe the spice, and therefore the eyes of the Abad, gave their eyes some kind of UV protection. And if not for protection against the sun, it wouldn't hurt for protection against wind and sand. I would love to hear your thoughts about it. Okay, interesting. Love it. Also, hadn't thought of it. <laughs> exact. I was going to say the same exact thing. I read so much Dune, and I never once thought, how do they protect their eyes? Is anyone wearing goggles out there? <laughs> squinting. <laughs> Just a, squinting. A lot of squinting. <laughs> According to Dune lore, we don't have any sense that the eyes of a bad are anything other than a byproduct of spice addiction with no real like benefit, like no UV protection or sand or particulate kind of resistance. We do get confirmation in the first book that when your eyes are changing into the eyes of a bod, you actually do see the world differently. You see hmm. your vision is changed. During Paul's first worm ride, you know, they're, they're riding on the worm, and this is right before they see the ornithopter that gurneys with in the smugglers. Yeah. We get this quote. Quote, Paul whirled the spice blue overcast on his eyes, made the sky appear dark, a richly filtered azure, against which a distant rhythmic flashing stood out in sharp contrast. End quote. So for the first time, we find out that Paul's vision is literally cast in blue. Nevertheless, it doesn't seem to be any kind of like, and such, Paul felt comfortable staring into the two sons of Arrakis. No, like we don't, <laughs> we don't get that. Uh, so I think it is safe to say that Fremen aren't just like staring into the sun when they're yeah. not up to anything. Or they're like, oh, there's a storm coming. Everyone open your eyes wide. I think people are pretty uh, avoidant of those things still even with the eyes of a bot. Right, right. And look, just because the eyes of a bot don't give them protection doesn't mean the Fremen don't have like some sort of natural UV protection or their eyes haven't evolved in some way to adapt. Because we do have examples in the book of Fremen physiology adapting to survival on Dune. Right. In the very first book, recall how Jessica observes this about shout out Maves's blood. Shout out to shout out. Quote, she tipped up the point, drew a delicate scratch with the blade's edge above Maves's left breast. There was a thick welling of blood that stopped almost immediately. 
ultra-fast coagulation, Jessica thought. A moisture-conserving mutation? End quote. That shows us right there that the Fremen have physically adapted to their environment in a way that helps them survive in the deep desert, perhaps more than an off-worlder could. And I don't think it's too far-fetched to assume that extends to some type of protection against ultraviolet rays or protection for their eyes against the glaring sun of Arrakis. So for me, even if the eyes of a bat aren't the answer to this question, I think the answer is presented in Dune. It's that they have adapted physiologically. And of course, the other thing, as Lucas pointed out, is the Fremen mostly operate at night. Right. And so like the UV rays, the heat, the dangers of being spotted out in the open on like a flat expanse of desert, all of that they avoid by just mostly being nocturnal. Right. Taking their naps in the daytime, you know? Yeah. Much like I wish I could do. <laughs> daytime naps. Stay up all night. Versus what? <laughs> napping from like 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. <laughs> Love a good nighttime nap. <laughs> all right. Let's switch gears a little bit yeah. and talk about the 2021 film. Here's a message from Joshua who talked about an alternate opening to the film that he read about. Hi, Spice Daddies. <laughs> okay, first nice. of all. Uh-huh. Um, I'm listening. Bit of a turn on that he called yeah, us that. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, hi Spice Daddies. What's up, Joshua? <laughs> San Diego Comic-Con is raging right now, and we ended <laughs> up getting- Something else is it. raging right now. <laughs> hey <-o! laughs> Sorry. Whew, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Straight to horny jail after this episode. <laughs> San Diego Comic-Con is raging right now, and we ended up getting an interesting blurb from Dune 2021's screenwriter Eric Roth about an idea for how the newest adaptation could have opened up with the creation of Arrakis. I think the parallels of Earth's creation with Arrakis's could have made for an excellent introduction to Herbert's themes for Dune for general audiences, and I was wondering what your thoughts on that could be. I love Denny's adaptation think it's almost perfect and wanting any more than what we got is almost entitled but this introduction to the movie would have been great too mm. incredible email <laughs> joshua thank you so much for sharing that and actually here is exact the exact quote from this article that joshua sent us yeah by eric roth who is one of the co-writers of the dude movie eric roth said quote the original opening of the movie was like the book of genesis from the bible and you would see the creation of a planet. We think it's Earth, and instead, it's Dune, with these oddball animals. And we see how the water went away and how the sand dunes were formed and all of that. And it was pretty great. But Denny said, this is magnificent, but we can't afford the rest of the movie. So that was it. End quote. Hmm. Okay. What do you think, Leah? What, what do you think of this, like, Book of Genesis-style time-lapse montage opening of Arrakis being formed. I think it would be an interesting alternative approach to telling this story that we know and love. And honestly, I, I think it would be a killer, like, standalone film. Like, if this was, like, a short film or an animated thing. I don't know. Like, a thing called Arrakis. Cool. That'd be great. But I have some criticisms regarding this adaptation of Dune. And to start off, I think this is something we can all get on board with. Which is, first and foremost, we need a good, straightforward, awesome version of Dune to tell the story of Dune. Yeah. <laughs> Something to welcome new fans into this fandom that we love. And, like, we've seen people make giant changes to the format of Dune, right? Jodorowsky wanted to have the planet attain <laughs> sentience and fly through the universe, spreading awakening. <laughs> David Lynch was like, sound guns, because I don't want sand karate. And it's like, God damn it, dude. Right. I think right. <laughs> we really shouldn't complicate this first true adaptation of Dune into a movie. Let's get it done well first, <laughs> and then we can experiment with form. Mm -hmm. Dune, as far as our narrative goes is elemental in its brutality. Like, it is utterly brutal. 
And showing everybody first, hey, look at this soft, beautiful, wet planet, this lovely thing, and watch it transform into this brutal, challenging place because of the introduction of worms, I feel like shifts the focus to the worms and says, look at this agent of change, look at this thing, and then we meet the Fremen who ride the worms and deal with the worms and all worms and worms, worms, worms. Shai Hulud the movie, right? I think keeping Arrakis as the brutal life and death impartial judge of qualities in a narrative sense is a smart move, at least for this first adaptation. Mm -hmm. But that's uh, that's my take on all this. Abu, how do you feel about all uh, about Eric's Eric Roth's words? You here for space Jesus and his space Genesis? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I feel similarly to you, actually. Uh, I'm going to have to disagree with Joshua on this. I don't think I'd like this as an opening to the movie Mm. for a lot of the reasons that you've stated as well. uh, I think it's a confusing opening to a movie. I think even more than that, though, it it kind of undermines a lot of the big moments in the story. Like a big part of this book, the first book in particular is how incredible it is that the Fremen are trying to change Arrakis, right? Yeah. Like, holy shit, these Fremen are out here secretly hiding away hundreds of millions of gallons or whatever of water so that they can change how this whole planet works? Like, ecologically? That's incredible. That's amazing. Yeah. And if the movie opened with showing us like this montage of the planet already going through ecological changes... I think it takes away from this incredible thing the Fremen are doing. So th- that's one reason I think it, this would actually take away from the film. I think in another way it takes away is something we talked about very recently on this very book club. In Children of Dune, Leto too accesses his other memory and goes far back enough to drop this bombshell on us. Quote, The sand trap, he repeated, was introduced here from some other place. This was a wet planet then. They proliferated beyond the capability of existing ecosystems to deal with them. Sand trout insisted the available free water made this a desert planet, and they did it to survive. End quote. Mm, Yeah. That's huge. That's a big reveal because for the first two books, we don't know this history of Arrakis. And it's not until Leto II and his superhuman abilities and his other memory that we realize, oh shit, Arrakis has actually gone through an ecological transformation once before. That's a big reveal that I think like you want to hold on to, right? You want to keep that in your back pocket to drop in a future movie. You do not want to drop that bombshell in like an opening two-minute montage sequence or something. Yeah. The other big reveal I think that this kind of takes away from opening the movie with this is about the sandworms themselves Mm. because we learn in the first book that the sandworms are directly related to spice production it is because of the worms that spice even exists on arrakis and this is an assumption because we don't know how this opening montage would have been handled but the way eric roth says you would see animals and you would see how the sand dunes are formed we know that's because of the sand trout and the sandworms so presumably you would be revealing to the viewer in the opening scene of the movie that the sandworms are connected to all of this and to the spice and to the desert and like those are all like very big ecological lore tidbits and information and bombshells that frank drops at certain points in the books right to expand our understanding of this planet and this story and i think those are things you have to play smart You have to keep them in your back pocket and tease them out to the viewer and then drop the bombshell on them when it's most effective. And I think dropping those bombshells too early takes away from some of the bigger reveals. So I don't know, that's sort of a long rambly answer on my part. (laughs) It may come off as nitpicky perhaps, but you know, that's what we're here to do. We're big Dune fans. It's the small lore details that matter to us. Ultimately, I think I am just also deeply attached to Denny's adaptation. I love it so, so much. So I admit there is some bias where I'm like, no, don't change the opening. I love it too much. I don't want anything different. 
Right. You know, Frank wrote a deeply human story. And I think shifting the focus away from the humans at all takes away from the potential for us as humans to resonate with the film. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Denis deciding to say, hey, the Fremen really matter. And the Fremen perspective is going to be key in this storytelling is great. We know they shot an opening of the movie where it's Duncan Idaho landing on the planet and finding the Fremen for the first time, which, of course, is a focus on Duncan, is a focus on this guy who we know fucks. And (laughs) yeah, he comes back in all three of the fucking books we've read. But good heavens, is that the story we need to tell in 2022? And I think you're right, Abu, that Denny did such a good job with what we got. It's hard to even be like, yeah, let's change it. But at the end of the day, it's a human story. I'm glad that the focus is on the humans, as always. For sure. I agree. But hey, Joshua, thank you for sharing this. Yes. Like, I, I know thank we you, just Joshua. spent like <laughs> 20 minutes being like, we hate this. Fuck you, but, Joshua. No. <laughs> <laughs> but like, again, I still appreciate this sort of insight from our listeners. A lot of our listeners will share YouTube videos or articles or interviews with us. And that's always appreciated. So thank you, Joshua, for sharing this with us and for sharing your thoughts on it as well. You know, we don't want to invalidate your opinion. If you think this would be a great opening to the film, that's great. Yeah. Maybe it would be. So thank you so much for sharing, Joshua. Indeed. Well, next up, we have some off-topic questions, which are always fun. Again, feel free at any time to ask these sorts of questions. This is a question from Anne. Without revealing anything too personal that you don't want to, I am super curious how you two met and then discovered you both love Dune. You have said you're different ages, with Leo being a bit older. <laughs> and, <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> ow, okay. And it doesn't sound like you met at college. Did you meet through a Dune fan club online or in person and Dune just came up? As hosts, I think it would be fun to hear. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks so much for the fun. All right. Well, we should also say how we met Neil deGrasse, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, yeah, considering yeah. he's been so patient getting his technical. Right, he's, he's been on the line with us this whole time. <laughs> the poor guy. Poor guy. The, the tech issues are unreal. We just can't hear him for some reason. Uh, we can see worst. him. You know, I can see him on the Zoom call. Yeah. He's, he's waving. He's been doing the floss, that like really cool <laughs> Fortnite dance. It's very, he's good at it. He's practiced. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think he's recording it for his TikToks, you know? <laughs> While the tech issues are being taken care of, he's multitasking. Classic Neil, always (laughs) on that grind. Yeah, let's talk about our uh, origin story. Yeah. Spider bites, gamma, radiation, uh, trauma. Uh, None of those, unfortunately. Uh, Some of that. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, that third one. Yeah, you got me on the third one. (laughs) You got me on the third one. Yeah, I guess it's time to uh, finally share our origin story. I believe, Leo, you and I met uh, when we were both working the same job around like 2016, 2017-ish, here in New York, actually. And I don't remember much of that time, Leo. I don't know how much you recall from all those years ago, but I recall us being quite friendly at work. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think it was like a deep friendship where we like hit it off and we're hanging out all the time and like texting each other every day. I think... For the most part, especially at the start, we were pretty much just like casual friends who talked at work, maybe grabbed lunch together every now and then. And we formed a friendship over many of the things we talk about on this podcast, video games, anime, Uh, not Dune at the time, but definitely a lot of our interests aligned. Yeah. You know, we worked in different parts of the job and I would kill time in Abu's part of the job because that was where like people that I got along better with (laughs) than in other parts of our business. Um, (laughs) And we would talk about like video games and anime and stuff. And I am a voice actor, but I started voice acting in like 2016, 2017. And that was like a very tumultuous time. So I would talk to people about my voice acting, like, oh, I booked this game or I just did an anime in 2016. And like, these are the things that I'm doing. So I remember talking to you about like my love of video games, but also my like activities as a voice actor 
And yeah. also I was like, I got cast in a couple of podcasts and we had talked about podcasts. And I remember you had told me that you had produced podcasts like since college, like for so long, uh, which I realize now was like, what, a year? <laughs> Youngin, because I'm ancient apparently and you're a child. According to Anne, yes, According you're an old crone. Anne, an old crone, uh, <laughs> older than Shai Lute. I I remember at one point, You were like, would you ever be interested in hosting a podcast about video game stories and video game lore? Yeah. Thinking about launching this thing with like seven other friends. So we'd have like rotating hosts. Wouldn't be a huge time commitment. Would you be in? And I was like, yeah, that sounds fucking great. I'd be down to talk about some games. And I think that that was when we first started really like outside of just being friendly at work like oh there's abu there's that guy i talked to about games and stuff i think that was when we really started corresponding and like planning and at least on the lore party front yeah definitely i mean our our podcasting journey together actually didn't start with gamjabar and dune like we did a number of episodes quite a few actually on the lore party podcast our video game show on the network we talked about like Stardew Valley, which is still some of our favorite, like some of my favorite episodes we've ever done for that show. Yeah. Uh, we, we talked a ton about Stardew Valley, did a number of episodes for that. We talked a lot about Mass Effect because you and I are, are both big Mass Effect video game fans. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we did a lot of that together. And I think, honestly, that's kind of where we uh, figured out that you and I have this like on mic chemistry together. Right. That we, ha- that we have this sort of natural back and forth that we have a very similar type of humor, that we know how to bounce off of each other. And it, it's kind of where we cut our teeth as hosts together, I think, is those early, like, Stardew Valley, Mass Effect, Last of Us, like, video game lore episodes we did for that show. Yeah, like, like to be clear, I am not going to claim for anybody out in listener land, like, I don't have an ego about any of this. I'm like, I don't know what we're doing. <laughs> I'm just doing my best. But I will say that as part of Lore Party and as part of my journey in general, I have co-hosted a number of things with a number of people. And with Abu, it was like the easiest and the most fun. And the exchange of like ideas and the way that we were able to like spitball off of each other felt very different. So I was like, if I'm going to call anything on mic chemistry, I'm going to call this <laughs> on mic chemistry. And like the Stardew Valley episodes were so much fun. And I remember us yeah. I remember us talking afterwards about we should do another game. We should talk about another thing, maybe something a little bit more substantial. I don't know. Like we'll figure it out maybe. We had that energy like 2019. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And you know what? I I couldn't agree more. Like I feel the same about you as well. Like there is a different vibe being on mic with you. I've been on mic with dozens of people but there is that x factor that you just don't get with every person right yeah uh so you know yeah you're right like as early as 2019 we knew that we had something but we just we were like ah, well you know we'll think about it maybe we'll make make something from this (laughs) right uh and then the opportunity came up because then the dune movie got announced and at that point, we had been we had been growing the Lord Party Network. So it started as that one show, and we had added a show that was very successful about the Witcher Netflix series. We had launched another video game show at that time. So we were sort of in development phase, and I was like, we should launch a Dune podcast. Right. I'm a big fan of Dune. This huge movie is coming out. We should cover this movie. We should cover the books. We should make a podcast about dune there are no dune podcasts out there and back in 2019 that was true like there are many of them out there now right but back in 2019 there was like two and one of them hadn't been active in like six years yes you in particular saw this like gap of something that didn't exist that we knew we could do well you know i'll say didn't know exactly we could do like i knew i was a big fan of dune (laughs) yeah and I was like, okay, I know I can do this. I can produce this and host this, but I, you know, I need a co-host. I need a partner in this. And no one else on the team, on the lore party team at that time on the staff had even read Dune. Right. <laughs> so I was like, oh shit. Uh, and then I just sort of, I was just like, I don't know. I've, let me ask Leo. 
I know Leo is a fan of sci-fi. We've geeked out about video games and anime and science fiction together. Maybe he's read Dune. Uh, so I texted you, and you, <laughs> this is great. You actually have this text, like, screenshotted and, like, framed somewhere. Tattooed <laughs> on my thigh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, no, <laughs> but yeah, we know exactly what that text says and when it was sent because you have it saved, um, which is amazing. I, I should have saved it as well. So we actually know what that said exactly because at two o three p.m. Eastern time on February seventh, twenty twenty, I texted you, "quote Hypothetically speaking, what is your interest in Dune?" End quote. I put on my sunglasses. I said, you son of a bitch, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what kicked it off. That, that, those are the words that kicked off what, you know, two years later now is Gamjabar. Yeah. This incredible journey. Uh, and, you know, a- after that, the rest is history. We started talking about it. We put a ton of time into sort of like pre-production and development into getting the show ready. We tossed around a bunch of ideas. Then we did it. A few months after that initial text, we launched the first episode of Gam Jabbar. It's true. You know, and I think two things come to mind. First, I know that we took it as seriously as we take it now then. And I think that's a huge thing. I think that is part of what led to us being where we are now is that we took it very seriously. But also, I think I went into rereading Dune with this intention to know and understand and absorb as much as I could. And I think that that was also big, but again, it just helps that like we enjoy talking about this stuff. So yeah, you're right. The rest is history. That's Gam Jabbar. That's Gam Jabbar. That's our origin story, our comic book origin story. So like I said, we swiped right. Uh, (laughs) And uh, you know, right. I mean, there is that whole thing about the third host that we murdered, but we try not to mention oh, that too much. Stop. Uh, um, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. You, you know, I realized by men- by saying we don't mention it, I did just mention it on the record. So. Neil uh, reacted visibly. <laughs> Again, his mic isn't working, but Mr. DeGrasse Tyson was shocked that you killed someone, that we killed someone. I shouldn't shirk the responsibility. <laughs> Yeah, we the the we both stabbed him with poison crystals. It wasn't just me. Simultaneous. <laughs> I hit him high. You hit him low. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Anne, for the great question, and yes, thank you for for taking a personal interest in in like sort of us and our story. That's very flattering that that you'd want to hear that. It is. Well, next up, we have another fun off-topic question from Sandeep from uh, Bangladesh. Sandeep says. I've heard both of you talk about anime here and there, and as a fellow weeb, hell yeah, <laughs> I was wondering if you guys have a podcast channel about anime. Thank you so much for your wonderful podcast. May you sit on the golden lion throne for 10,000 years. Hell yeah. Oh, and then we're going to be murdered by a 20-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> Steals our Jordans, our uncreased Jordans. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, well, quickly, no, we don't have an anime channel podcast thing right i'm not opposed but we're very busy right now we're very busy down the road (laughs) maybe down the road we'll see but yes we are both big anime fans we're super into it i think in lieu of a one word answer no (laughs) uh (laughs) let's share a little bit about our favorite or maybe like recent anime things and, you know, you and I could probably talk about this for another hour, and this episode's already long. Neil deGrasse Tyson is falling asleep <laughs> as, uh, as we talk. But uh, <laughs> let's share one anime we recently watched and one anime that we consider, like, one of our favorites of all time, and maybe a little bit of why, in case someone hasn't seen it yet. So, Abu, what do you think? Recent one you love. Okay, I'll start with the one that I absolutely love. This is an easy one for me to recommend to anyone out there. Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood is one of my all-time favorite anime. Yep. It's very easy to recommend to anyone because I think this is the kind of anime that is for everyone. Even people out there who 
don't think they could ever get into anime. It is just so good. Like it's it's hard for me to even think of any criticisms. The writing, the animation, the action, the music, the voice acting, the story, the pacing of it all. It's top notch, like ten out of ten masterclass stuff. Yeah. And it's also a relatively short series. You know, we we've joked on the podcast before how neither of us want to get into One Piece because yep. too long. A thousand episode commitment is too much. Who has the too time? Much. Too many things. Full Metal Alchemist is only a handful of seasons. I think it's like maybe four or five seasons. And it's the type of show that you can just sort of like binge and complete. And again, the pacing is just so good that there isn't necessarily any filler, right? Like anime, it's an anime trope that exists out there is like a lot of it will contain just filler episodes to kill time before we get back to the story. And I don't think Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood contains any filler. Every episode either advances the plot or advances the character arcs in some meaningful and hugely impactful ways. And so it doesn't feel like a long anime in ways that other anime can feel long. Yeah. So th that's the one that I love and I would recommend anyone interested in anime start with. Oh, yeah. When it comes to one that I've watched recently that I've really enjoyed, I have to shout out Spy Family. This anime has been blowing up. And it actually just wrapped its first season. Uh, it's only like 12 or 13 episodes, so it's a perfect time to dive into this if you're interested. It's just so dang cute. The premise is so fun. Every single character is just so instantly likable. And it's this perfect balance of like sort of dry humor, mm -hmm. which I love. That's That's my particular brand of humor. And also like deeply emotional and imp in impactful scenes because at the core of the show it's this family it's this chosen family that comes together none of them are actually related they all have secrets but they are coming to love each other and starting to act like family for each other and it, it, it's beautiful like a, a show that's like so quirky and so cute and so funny has also made me cry multiple times in just the first season in just the first 12 episodes right and I, I think that's an incredible achievement. So that's the one I would recommend for folks who are looking for something recent to get into. Check out Spy Family. Yeah, totally. What about you? What's an anime that you absolutely adore and one that you've enjoyed recently? Well, there are so many that I love that I feel like most people have seen. So like like My Hero Academia fucking is awesome. Ah, uh, yes. Love it. Ah. Uh go be further beyond plus ultra <laughs> but i i want to kind of recommend one that a lot of people i've talked to recently haven't seen and this is one of my favorites of all time which is monster by naoki urasawa which i think is you can watch it on it's either hulu or, or amazon but it's fucking awesome it's so good it's 74 episodes and it's done like you're just beginning middle and end great you're following this Japanese neurosurgeon roaming the like countryside of Europe as he's hunting down a kid whose life he saved, who turns out to be this psycho byproduct of like World War II orphan torture experiments. Oh my God. And it's very grounded and like there's some hyperbole, like there's some anime hyperbole and there's some, you know, moments of, of intense drama and maybe like supernatural things a little bit but most of it watches like a modern hbo series like it was one of the first shows that i watched where i was like oh anime is a whole art form wow like it's not just bleach and naruto and dragon ball z right it's more than just fighting and big explosions and big bads that you have to defeat it's deep it's psychological it's characters who have drives that are certainly easy to state, but who have deeper motivations and deeper conflicts where they begin to doubt themselves and there is no right and wrong. And even the villain is not exactly the villain he turns out to be, right? So everything mm. is wrapped in this like psychological layers. It's wonderful. So that's my recommendation, Monster by Naoki Urasawa. And it does end up on people's like top 15 lists and top 10 lists, but 
a lot of people I've talked to haven't watched it. So check it out if that sounds good to you. And a recent one, I also watched Spy Family. Fantastic. So instead of that, I'll say I'm finally watching, kind of behind the fold here, but um, I'm finally watching Vinland Saga. Mm. And, you know, I'm a pretty Scandinavian dude. I'm fairly (laughs) Scandinavian. So to see this, like, Viking anime of, you know, big Norse fellas fighting each other with these basically superhuman abilities, it's super fun. It's so bloody. (laughs) It's, like, so violent. (laughs) And the themes are, like, revenge and honor and, you know, how far is too far and things like that. But so many of the other shows that I'm watching these days are, like, nice and dry and funny and cute it's nice to uh have a show that is like very bloody and very like serious in a lot of ways um also fun fact patrick seitz is in vinland saga he's in monster he's also in full metal alchemist brotherhood wow he's just not in spy family so oops (laughs) maybe season two Maybe, Maybe next season, yeah. right? Patrick, get on that. <laughs> get on that, Mr. Seitz. All right. <laughs> anyway, that's uh that's a show that I'm working through now. Thank you so much, Sadeep, for your email and for letting us geek out a bit more about anime. Because that's that's certainly speaking of our origin story, that's certainly one thing we connected on when we first met. And it's a passion of ours. And that does it, Leo. That does it <sighs> for it. another round of mailbag. Another set of amazing questions from our incredible listeners. Yeah. I love it. I love these episodes. That was so much fun. It's just such a shame that we had all those technical problems with poor Neil, who's I still, know. I mean, I know. he's writing something like, I think he's writing his favorite anime, but I just don't think we have time to find out what it is. <sighs> yeah. He's Sorry. really, he's trying to, he's being comprehensive as we know he is. Yeah. It's long. It, just single words, Neil. Single words. <laughs> Sign it out. <laughs> Two words. Okay. Sounds like no. Well, for the next episode that you'll get on your feed it is going to be a standard book club episode. So make sure that you've read up to page 348 in the uh, paperback edition. And if you've got a different edition than us, it's going to end on the sentence quote, It's done he thought, and they can read it in only one way. End quote. Oh, wait. Oh, I think Neil's, he's turning the the whiteboard around. Yeah. Oh. Dragon Ball GT? Uh, 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 <laughs> that, that's a hot Neil, take, Neil deGrasse Tyson. that's awful. Terrible choice. <laughs> All right, next that's time. That's a hot take. I'm never inviting him back. Let's get uh, Bill Nye. I bet Bill Nye's got good anime taste. <laughs> good anime taste. Yeah, yikes. <laughs> Fuck uh, off, yeah, Neil. I'm just, I'm just gonna hang up on Neil real <laughs> yeah, quick let's hang here. Yeah, Dragon Ball GT, get the Bullshit. fuck out of here! Bullshit, dude. It's not even canon. It's not even canon. R- red monkey <laughs> saying, "Ugh." <laughs> <laughs> well, friends, there is no real ending. It's just the place where you stop the recording. But this podcast is always one step beyond logic. So. Help spread the word of Mwadib and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And be sure to check out the other shows on the Lore Party Podcast Network on loreparty.com. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at lore underscore party. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, whoever controls the podcast controls the universe. We'll see you on the golden path. It looks like Neil wrote, Anything with tentacle, Neil, uh, Neil, Neil! <laughs> Jesus, horny Neil jail. deGrasse Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> That's why you love space. You're just looking for them lovers <laughs> among the stars. <laughs> Naughty oh, Neil. That's so, so funny. <laughs>